In the mid-90s, a music journalist by the name of Paolo Hewitt came on board with Oasis for the Morning Glory and the Be Here Now era, and he wrote two books about his experiences. They were Getting High, about the Morning Glory era, and Forever the People, about the Be Here Now era. Recently, it was my privilege to meet and chat to Paolo over Zoom about his experiences with the band. And he was kind enough to share some stories and memories, some of which have never been shared before. So, please join me to meet Paolo Hewitt to hear the story of how he came to be involved with Oasis, some of his best memories with each individual member of the band, and how he came to make the decision to move on to Pastures New. So, Paolo Hewitt, hello. How are you? I'm good, thank you. So how did your association with Noel and the band actually start? I used to be a writer on the music press. I was started off on Melody Maker, then I went to the enemy. I'm from a town called Woking. I knew Paul Weller from Woking. He and I both arrived in London at separate times that we kind of hooked up. And I wrote the official jam biography of Beat Concerto in bloody hell, 1983. And Noel's a big jam fan, so he knew who I was. I went to see Oasis at Kentish Town Forum just before Definitely Maybe came out. Two nights later, they played the Astoria, and afterwards there was a party, and that's when I first met Noel. And then he asked me to DJ at a gig, which was the South End one, which is on DVD, and then it kind of all kind of spiralled forward from that. I mean, I remember they played a huge gig in um, Scotland and right at the end, I suddenly realised I need to put a record on it. And I had the Beatles compilation. I just, just put this needle on, you know, and it just hit Hey Jude straight away. And it just went beautifully with all this chaos, you know. It just kind of, where's the guitars died down? I hey Jude. And the whole place that sang along to it, man. It was just, and afterwards all the reviews were about the crowd singing hey jude and uh, noel was like you've got better reviews than i <laughs> <laughs> so paolo would you share with me what was your your most memorable moment with liam during your time with the band we were round at noel's and it was late october bonfire night was coming up and we're sitting there talking and Noel's got the TV on, and on comes this documentary about the Ku Klux Klan. So the TV <laughs> TV is just full of these guys with the white um, sheets on there and carrying burning crosses. And Liam looks up and he goes, fuck me, he goes, they're taking Halloween a bit seriously, aren't they? <laughs> That was Liam, man. That was Liam. He was just he funny as fuck he could be. That was priceless Liam. He was always doing shit like that, you know. Yeah. I remember well, he saying to me once, Do you know what? Noel's just Noel's just walked in the room and he's just said, This place smells like balloons. What the hell does that mean, man? Balloons. Balloons don't smell. It's genius. You know, that's what it was. It was all this <laughs> kind of surreal stuff, you know. There was some interviews he did in the NME where he talked about other bands. I think, God, you should be a rock critic in his own inimitable way. You know, he would just pinpoint a band. He'd go, they're this, you know, and he go, yeah, you're right, they aren't that. He seems to amp it up a bit because you see some interviews with him where he's really chilled and he's just, he's just kind of, he's, he's talking normally. And you see other Liam ones. is Liam is Liam is Liam. He just, he, he's himself for everything, and whatever mood he's in, he's he won't hide that mood. If, for example, before this interview, I was in a really bad mood, I was thinking, I'm doing that interview in a minute. I'll forget whatever it is that's bothering me and, you know, do the interview and be as good as I can. Liam wouldn't. Liam would just come on and say, oh, fucking really bad mood, man. <laughs> fucking cunt. You know, he'd be like that. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> he, he just doesn't, uh, what's that word? Self-regulate. He doesn't self-regulate himself, which makes him fascinating. People like that are fascinating. So sometimes with Liam, he, he'd, you know, he'd offer me outside or, you know. I mean, in Dublin, he was he got a bad throat. They gave him steroids. They say, do not drink. So the first thing he did was drink 10 pints of Guinness. He was having a go at Noel, and I told him, I said, he's got to go and sing in a minute. He's like, oh, you want to, you know. 
I mean, there was always that. Did you ever actually, um, did you ever, did it ever come to blows between you and Liam? No, 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 no. I always <laughs> I just walked away. I'm a writer, not a fighter. I think my favourite photo of Oasis, one Jill Fermanowski did, is for the Be Here Now sessions. And they're all standing there and they're really laughing because Liam's obviously said something and they're just all cracking up, you know. And that to me was Oasis, you know. It was just, mm. it was just so much fun. You know, they really were a fun band, you know. They, they had this incredible humour. I remember the launch of Morning Glory. That was sort of early in the afternoon and we went back to Knowles after and we were all lagging by then. The, band, the album went on sale at midnight and they're doing an in-store thing at Virgin Megastore. How we, how we got down there, I'll never know. But Noel was going to live. I'm telling you this right now. You're going to forget every lyric to every song that I play tonight. And Liam's like, no, oh, fuck him. He said, you will. I'm going to bet you a hundred quid. He's like, I'll fucking prove you fucking man. He stormed off. And then we get to the Virgin Megastore. Noel sits down with the guitar. You know, he goes, you know, this one's called Hey Now. You know, Liam's like, what are the fucking lyrics to this? <laughs> I was like, 100 quid, please. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it was like then, you see. You know, so with Noel, it was just, it was just, oh man, it was just funny. You know, just watching football together. It was those first two years, man. It was, both summers were really nice. And just going around to his place and just all this craziness going on and just laughing. Just, we just laughed the whole time. I remember the first interview I ever read with him, which was in ID magazine, and he went, he said something like, I'm going to make a shitload of money and probably lose it all and end up in the gutter. But as long as my name goes down with Pete Townsend, Steve Marriott and Ray Davis, I'm happy. You know, and I was like, oh, I like this guy. Do you know what I mean? Mm. The start of my Getting High book is actually about going down to the studio in Fulham where they just recorded The Master Plan, which is probably my favourite Oasis song. The, the thing I remember the most was the bitching going on between Liam and Noel. You know, Liam would always go to Noel, and Noel was used to it, and he was just ignoring it. And something had happened in Paris. Liam, Gwigsy, and Bonehead had gone to Paris, and there'd been some kerfuffle there. And they'd kept it hidden from Noel. <laughs> and Noel had found out about it and was questioning Liam. You know, what was going on in Paris, man? Oh, you know, nothing to do with me. Oh, it was nothing to do with you that the photographer pulled out to see. You know, it was that kind of stuff. You know, and it was back and forth, back and forth. And I was thinking, God, this is going to get out of hand. And then we went to the studio and he put on the master plan and it was just, I mean, that song is just, you know, beyond. And I remember it finishing and Liam just going, fuck me. And it's a B side <laughs> and, you know, smiles all round. you know, I went up to Rockfield, me and Noel were walking down this corridor and he pointed at a cricket bear where that's what I whacked Liam with the other week. <laughs> <laughs> So what about Bonehead? What's your what's your best memory with Bonehead? When going up to his house in Manchester to interview him, here's a story for you. He told me that, uh, so he moves into this place in Manchester. It's in that rich area. There's a rich area in Manchester. You know, Johnny Marr lives there, the footballers. So he buys a place there. And you know what? For all their fucking cockneys and all that, he was the only one who stayed in Manchester, Bonehead. You know, Noel and Liam giving it me about Cockneys. I'm like, yeah, you live in Primrose Hill. You live in Hampstead. <laughs> so anyway, Bonehead moves in and there's this guy next door who's a colonel, like a retired colonel. And when they're moving in, the colonel pops his head over the fence and he goes, um, he said, excuse me, old boy. He said, um, you know, you're moving in. Welcome to the neighbourhood. He said, um, he said, look, uh, the, the, the dahlias, the flowers are coming over the fence. I'm really sorry about that. Tell you what, old boy, why don't you come round, come round to mine tonight, have a brandy. Be great to know you, you know, new neighbour. So um, Bernard, Bernard thought, you know, keep the peace and whatever. He said, yeah, yeah, I'll pop round. So he goes round there. He walks in. Hello there, old chap. Come in, come in. She says, well, what do you want to drink? Do you want a brandy? He said, yeah, that'd be great, you know. So the bloke's pouring out the drink. So, so what do you do, old chap, to, you know, buy a house like that? He said, oh, I'm a guitarist in a band. And this guy goes, well, I hope you're not in that fucking Oasis band, that bunch of fucking hooligan, truck-taking bastards. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> 
there's a bit in the book which I'm really proud of, actually, which is Bonehead finds out that Liam hasn't got a place to live and starts getting a campaign <laughs> together to get Liam a house. Because Liam, after leaving Burnage, had stayed in hotels all the way through. He didn't have a house, you know. And Bonehead was like... And I managed to get all that dialogue down. You know, I was really proud of that. It's a great chapter, that. Because hmm. it shows the closeness of the band at that time and how they were looking after each other. Do you know what I mean? They were really, he hasn't got a home. That's not right. We've got to sort this out. Come on, you know, blah, blah, blah. So, I mean, the thing is, when I first saw them at Kentish Town, I was like, you know, they, they came on like a gang. They were like a gang, you know. They stood there, like, looking at the audience, like, and just making this huge music, but they wouldn't dance or move, you know. They just looked like a gang, you know. And for a long time, they, they had that gang spirit, you know. Well, what about the probably the most mysterious Oasis member, Gwigsy? My favourite memories of Gwigsy are when we wrote the Robin Friday book together. You've got to understand about Gwigsy. He's a fountain of football knowledge, right? He'd tell you who played left back for Bulgaria in the 1968 World <laughs> Cup. Do you know what I mean? He's like that level. And he showed me this article in Shoot magazine about this guy whose name was Robin Friday, right? Now, imagine if a Liam Gallagher character played football but made Liam Gallagher look like Mother Teresa. That was Robin Friday, right? I mean, this guy was off the fucking scale. He said, we've got to find out more about him. That summer, 96, they had three months off Oasis. And every Wednesday, we'd meet at Paddington and we would go down to Reading to the local newspaper and research this guy, Robin Friday, to see if there was a story there, to see if there was a book there. And there was. There was enough for a book there. So you've got to imagine there's this Reading paper and me and Gwigsy bowl up. We want to know about this guy, Robin Friday. They're like, oh, OK, well, you're an Oasis, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, I am, yeah. Wow, yeah, because 1996, they're just, you know, they're, they're, they're the Beatles, right? They put us in this room. Nothing was digitised. There was nothing on computer. It was just all these bound volumes, you know, and we had to go through them. It was a daily paper. It wasn't a fucking weekly one. It was a daily one, man. So we were, oh, man. But what would happen? Every half hour, somebody would come in, some young girl or so. Oh, hi, yeah, I've just come looking for some of uh, Oh my God, you're Quixie from our Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. And then they go off and then something comes. Oh yeah, I've just got. Oh, you're Quixie. <laughs> One week, the, the guy who we who who was kind of helping us out, this sports writer, Clive Baskerville. We're in there one day, and he comes in and he goes, um, Quixie. He said um, the local MP says uh, that anybody who takes drugs is a psychopath. And uh, Quixie goes, Well, he's a fucking wanker, isn't he? And he can fuck off. Anyway, we go down next week. <laughs> And on the front of the paper, Gwigsy slams local MP in a furious tirade. Paul McGuigan. So that, those are my favourite memories with Gwigsy. We had a great time. We really did. And we wrote the book together and it did really well. The thing about Gwigsy was, as he said to me, he says, great. He said, I've got all the money. He had a wonderful house. So Gwigsy was there. He had his little recording studio. He had his beautiful wife. He had a son. You know, so I've walked into news agents at the complete high of o Oasis Mania and nobody recognises me. You know, Noel and Liam couldn't move. Hmm. I mean, one time I was with Noel in Italy. We came back to the hotel and this mob of Italian youth, they, they just grabbed Noel. They dad him up like this, throwing him in the air. You know? And Gwigsy could just walk into a shop, you know, spark up, do his little fucking bass line, stand in the studio, watch Sky Sports News, you know. He had it sorted, man. Really did. Uh, he was a fan of George Harrison, and I could see it because, you know, the quiet one. He was the quiet one, man. The last time I saw him, he was talking about going into gardening, landscape gardening. Interesting. That'll be some news for the fans. Do you have any memories of any shared experiences with Alan White? Well, Alan, I kind of knew because of the Weller connection, because obviously his brother Steve. But Alan, Alan was just a really charming, you know, very easygoing guy. I mean, I remember Noel saying to me, he goes, fuck him, what is he going to make of this band? You know, he's rolled, he rolls up at Rockfield by me hitting the lead singer, chasing the lead singer around the studio with a creak. <laughs> but Alan was just lovely. I, I got on with that. Well, obviously, because we were Londoners. So in their eyes, Cockneys. He was much more of a Londoner than me. I'm from Woking. But, you know, Alan had a really good wit about him and was very laid back. And he, he didn't get sucked into it all, you know. 
drummers can't have to be uh, fit, don't they? You know, they've got to play for an hour and a half every night. You know, you can't be howling at the fucking moon till seven in the morning. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? He was because he was the one who never took drugs, wasn't he? Yeah, no, he was. He just, you know, he was just very, you know, yeah, he just wouldn't be, you know, like I say, they're drummers, man. They 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 operate. They're like goalkeepers in football. They're their own tribe. You know what I mean? Yeah. From your uh, your books, there does seem to be an obvious uh, kind of feeling that you and Noel were quite close. Do, do you guys still yeah. see each other ever? No, 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 no. Because it all got a bit, it all got very rock starry. That be here now tour just kind of Noel became something else. Really, do you know what I mean? The fun went out of it, and I think everybody gets milk dry. Do you know what I mean? And then put it this way: when I first met them, they were going to Japan, right? And my small faces book had just come out, and it was like we're going to fucking Japan. Wow, fucking old Japan, fucking old, you know, it's all that. Mm. I remember Noel calling me out, Paolo. I'm, I'm in the middle of fucking Virgin Megastore in Tokyo. I thought about twenty of your small faces books. I'm chucking them at people, you know. <laughs> <It> was, <laughs> do you know what I mean? It was like buy twenty more and chuck some more, <laughs> <laughs> you know. And then four years later, it was fucking Japan. Are we going to fucking Japan? Not staying that shit hotel. Again. Do you know what I mean? It, it just become like that, you know. The, the excitement had gone out of it, you know. I think Noel really wanted it. I think Noel really wanted it, but I don't think the others were that keen on it. You know, whether that album was standing on the shoulders, you know. You know, he he had a no drugs policy going. You know, in in the studio, and Grigsby was like. I have me fucking weed, man. <laughs> you know, I mean, it become something else. You know, by then I was kind of withdrawing from it all. Anyway, no one had that huge place out in the country, and things change, and they have to. You know, before I used to go to Camden and, and watch match of the day with him, and you know, and then I'd go round to the other place, and there'd be like fifty other people there. Do you know what I mean? It all got a bit out of hand for me. I'm not knocking anybody on this. To go through that, to sell 600,000 albums in a day, it must be hard to keep your balance on that one. I'm not knocking it at all. I'm really not. No. But it just wasn't for me. What was for me was, you know, those early days, you know. And I was very privileged, James. It was a phenomenon. It really was a phenomenon. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a slightly controversial point here. I know this is your biggest hit, but my favourite is this one. Forever the people. I th I, I okay. love that. I've read that multiple times, cover to cover. Really, because, really. Yeah, I love okay. it. I love. I feel like that captures a a lost chapter of the world yeah. of Oasis. You know, the the Teotihuacan trip and all that business, all the stuff that happened on the Be Here Now tour. Now, I mean, the thing is about that tour. That tour broke Oasis. I think after Nedworth, they should have gone away for at least six months. They should have gone and hid away for six months. The sense of danger and excitement had all gone, and then Bonehead walked, then a Gwigsy walked. You know, it was the end of the band, man. And I make the point in that book that, that all they spoke about when they were together was the old days. Gwigsy and Bonehead were the funny ones, man. Do you know what I mean? Especially Bonehead. Do you know what I mean? I mean, he was hilarious. So it had just gone, you know, that kind of excitement had gone, you know. So, so that, that Be Here Now tour, you think that it was the actual tour itself that kind of sucked the life out of the band? Yeah, 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 yeah. They were all travelling in separate cars. Before we used to, when I went with them, it would be on a coach with bunks. That's how it ran. But that, that was the end of that first phase. I saw this headline in the Daily Mirror about two years after all this, and it said, Oasis must have a new album coming out. Liam's just hit a photographer, you know. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It was like, it'd been like years and years of this stuff. Whereas before, it was like, wow, he's done what, you know, there was an excitement of you know, there's some bands who are really suited to that kind of level of superstardom, but I just didn't think Oasis were, and the fun had gone. It just wasn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can I, I can see it in your face. Actually, it's really interesting. You 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 come alive when you're talking about the heyday, and there's a there's a yeah. heaviness. There's a heaviness when you talk about the be here now stuff. It was just horrible. That tour was horrible. I wish I'd never gone on it. To be honest with you. Really? I mean, I know I got a good. Yeah, yeah. Because it was just. It wasn't a know, group of lads having fun anymore. No, no. I mean, there were some nights. There were a couple of nights, you know, when it was great and it was back to that. But most of the time, it was just oh, 
painful. But well, like I say, I've, you know, I'm, I'm uh, you know, I'm very, very grateful for um, to uh, to be there now. See what you did there. I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, Paolo, thank you so much, man. It's been an absolute privilege to hear your stories, to actually meet no, you. Thank you. Thank you. Where can people find you online? The two Oasis books that you're talking about there are available as ebooks, or you can buy buy them as physical publications from Dean Street Press. I'm on Twitter and I'm on Facebook. Cheers, mate. Well, all the very best. Right, it's great yeah, to have a good Take night, mate. Yeah, you as well. So that's it, guys. Thank you for watching. Go check out Paolo's books if you haven't yet. And as always, I'll see you next time.